Welcome in, everyone. This is today. <laughs> this is today. And today I'm gonna be presenting my PhD. It's a real thing that I did. So for the past four years, I've been doing my PhD studying sperm whales in the Caribbean. And that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I made this presentation with a lot of background information. Even if you have no idea what a sperm whale is, you'll be able to follow along. If you have any question, uh, please ask them in the chat. I want this to be a conversation. I want people to talk throughout it. Cause like, that's like the big thing that I don't like about academia is that it feels really one-sided. So I want this to be like a community that, you know, I want this to be like fun. This is really weird, but I'm actually like kind of nervous. I don't know why. It's just like, I, like my whole life, I've kept like my PhD life in one corner and my streaming life in the other corner. And today I'm like putting them together. And I'm really excited about it, but I'm also like kind of nervous. Let's do it. This is a fish's PhD. Okay, so today's presentation. <laughs> First, we'll see who's the sperm whale. Uh, so we're gonna just go into like a quick introduction about like basic stuff about sperm whales. They're pretty cool. I like them. I hope you guys like them. I can show you guys this. Your normal whale has like this thing that's like baleen, right? So they have like this like their little head here. And then they have like those like kind of like grove underneath it, right? So that's like your average whale. And then when they eat, what they do is that they kind of like open their mouth like this. And then like all the little like plankton gets in. And after that, they close their mouth again and they like expel the water out and the plankton stays in, right? So they kind of like chomp the plankton and then like the plankton gets stuck in those like weird little filters that's what that's baleen whales and that's like the blue whales the humpback whales like they're all like that sperm whales instead they have teeth so they only have teeth at the bottom of their jaw like this and they eat squid sperm whales sometimes hunt uh, colossal squids which are almost their size sometimes bigger so you like literally have like in the depths of the ocean like sperm whales battling like giant squids um, just like so. So they're pretty much like eating krakens, <laughs> which is kind of badass. <laughs> if I, if I must say so myself, it's kind of badass. Sperm whales can like dive like super, super far below the surface. So they can eat all the squid they want. How long can they hold their breath? So sperm whales can, so like when I study them in the wild, they usually dive for about an hour. Uh, so that's like an easy, like everyday thing that they do. So like they'll like fluke up go down to dive they'll stay underwater for like about an hour and then like come back up to breathe they could probably hold their breath much longer that's like their average dive cycle is one hour so I, I wouldn't be surprised if they could hold their breath for like an hour and a half two hours but i don't think there's like clear uh, answer as to like the max capability but the average is one hour not sure if this is already addressed but why are sperm whales called sperm whale? it's kind of concerning of a name yes yes so uh, let me do another drawing this is this is your sperm whale, right like they have this like big nose that's like their little mouth here and then they have like of course like their tail at the back that's a little body and that's their little eyes and then like as we know like they have only teeth at the bottom of their head so uh the reason why they were called sperm whales is that uh, during the whaling era, so when people were hunting whales to get access to their oil, so that they could like use the oil to make lamps <laughs> and to like kind of like fuel the industrial revolution, pretty much. They targeted sperm whales because in the sperm whale nose, so like if you go like in the anatomy of the sperm whale, the nose here is actually filled uh with a thick white liquid <laughs> that kind of looks like sperm it's called the spermaceti organ and the sperm whale use it to send out echolocation which is kind of like their sonar system but because the goop looks like sperm and whalers were very mature back in the day they called them sperm whales it's not actually sperm. Um, it's like a liquid. It's like, yeah, it's called the spermaceti organ. But they didn't care. They didn't care. They were just like, yeah, whatever. Sperm whales. <laughs> they are a very weird looking whale. Like, especially compared to, like, they don't look like dolphins. They don't look like the other, like, baleen whales, like the humpback whales or like blue whales. Like, they, like, don't fit any of, like, the shape categories. They're very unique 
and what they do. And that makes them super interesting, I think. But it also makes them weirdos. So yeah, we're gonna talk about who's the sperm whale, where I studied sperm whale, the context of my PhD. So like, what did we know before I started? Like, what knowledge did I build on? Because as you guys know, in science, like, you don't, like, start from scratch every time. You just, like, build upon the discoveries of, like, past scientists. And likewise, in the future, people will build on my PhD discoveries to discover new stuff. And what were the questions I had when I started my PhD? Then I'm going to talk about my objective with my PhD, my discoveries. <laughs> and then finally, we're going to like wrap it up with some like take home messages and like all that stuff. The sperm whale. This is a sperm whale. And sperm whale, as I said, are tooth whales. And they do make sounds uh, through their like big spermaceti organ. And they communicate with each other. They're quite social. And I think they're super interesting. They're marine mammals, so they need to come back to the surface to breathe. And what's very special about sperm whale, uh, we call this a blow. What's very special about sperm whale blow is that it's sideways. So if you're on a boat and you're looking out for whales and you see a diagonal blow, that means you have sperm whale because they're the only whale that uh, blows diagonally. Here is your ocean, just like that. And then if you're at sea, and you see a blow that is straight like this. Uh, that can be a humpback whale. It can be a fin whale. It can be a minky whale. Like it can be like most baleen whales will have a blow like this. And if you see a blow that's like this, so that's like angled sideways and like closer to the water, that would be a sperm whale. Uh, if we go back to the sperm whale nose here, so we have uh, their blow is located on the tip of their nose like that. And if we look like on the top view of the nose, so like this is like the nose <laughs> from a top view. So like the eyes are here. Uh, the nose is angled sideways on the tip of the head. So when they breathe, it goes to the side. On the other hand, other whales. So for example, if we go back to our humpback whale here, their blows is actually located at the top of their head uh, like this. So when they blow, it goes straight. And if we do the top down view, with the two eyes here, the blow would be right here. And that's where they would like breathe from. The reason why that is different for the different type of whales is that, as I mentioned earlier, sperm whales dive very deep. So humpback whales will only stay underwater for like 10 to 15 minutes. But because the sperm whales are down for so long, as soon as they reach the surface, they want to take that breath. And because of this, the blowhole, so like the, like the thing that they breathe through, like their nostril pretty much, moved from the back of their head to the top of their head. So that is the very first thing that reaches the surface. So on average, um, they stay underwater for an hour, like 45 minutes to an hour is like everyday dives for them. It's like very much like the average that would, you would expect. So we just get, which is a long time. <laughs> So they do use their eyesight, but mostly at the surface when they're interacting with each other or like looking at boats and stuff. Uh, but underwater, what they use mostly, especially when they're foraging and hunting, is echolocation. So if we go back uh, to this little Wi-Fi signal, <laughs> so they have their own sonar. Uh, so pretty much what they do is that they send clicks out. So they like click, which is called echolocation. And based on like how those clicks like how the sound waves re reverberate back to them, uh, how the sound travels to them, they're able to create this like 3D map of the environment. And that's how they see underwater. Like bats, yeah, bats also use echolocation. So yeah, this is what the sperm whale would look from the surface. So like if you're on the boat or if you're out and about and um, you're like, you see a whale and you want to know what type of whale it is uh, from the surface, this is what it would look like. So they have obviously this very big nose. They have this like sideways blow, which is like the biggest style. Like when you're at sea and like when I'm at sea studying whales or like any marine biologist, like when you're looking for whales, the biggest thing you're looking for is a blow. So like a little puff of like white on the horizon. So you find that puff, you can like slowly approach and like see what it is. If you're lucky and they're already like, they popped up like right next to you. Uh, the sperm whale back is like quite low profile. So while like the humpback whales have this like hump like fin, a lot of other whales have this like small fins on their back. Sperm whales, they only have this like, they call it the dorsal ridge. So they have this kind of like rectangular 
uh, dorsal fin and then like little ridges, kind of like dinosaurs, which I'll show, I'll show pictures of that later. And then when they dive, they almost always bring their fluke up because as I said, they go like very, very deep in the ocean. So they slowly bring the fluke up. The fluke will be like almost like 90 degrees to the water and then they'll go down. And that's very different from once again, those humpback whales or blue whales or fin whales, which often like their fluke will like go in the water at an angle because they're not diving as deep, right? They don't need to like go like crazy down and then like keep going. They often like just like do like a little bell dive. So their tail is not going to go 90 degrees. It's going to go kind of like 45 degrees into the water. And their bodies is often like a darker shade of gray than you would expect from other whales. But that's kind of a hard one because like with different lightings and stuff, like they can look blue or green or yeah, brown or black. Like it's, it's quite hard. So I would guess like the color is not the best tail for sperm whales or other whales. Like their body can take very different shades. They are the largest Adontoses, so they're their largest two whales. Um, so if we look at this um, poster of all the whales that exist in the world, so those are the cetaceans. So they're your whales and dolphins with the little little fish person as reference, <laughs> right here. The sperm whales are part of, as I said, of the two whales, meaning they have teeth. So they're like much more closely related to dolphins, to beaked whales to porpoises, belugas, and all that stuff than they are to the, the baleen whales, which are like here, your blue whale, you got the humpback whale, and all that stuff. And uh, that's the differences. So this, these are your baleen whales on the left, and the toothed whales on the right. And the sperm whales are the biggest of the toothed whales, so they're like the biggest member of that category. Sperm whales on average are 12 meters. They can go all the way up to 20 meters so that's a lot that's like what 10 humans <laughs> it's quite a lot of humans oh they're big boys they're big boys they're big boys with big brains absolute chonker units they are they are absolute chonkers they're very fatty they're very large and we love them they're very very thick they're thick with tree seeds <laughs> but yeah so one of the big evolutionary pressure that made uh, not only sperm whales but other marine mammals to be much bigger uh, so like dolphins are also quite large like they're around like three meters and stuff is that the ocean is cold it's like as easy as that like you lose your body heat way faster in the water than you do on land and you've probably experienced that like if you're outside in like 80 fahrenheit weather um you'll be really warm and you'll be very comfortable and you'll stay very warm and comfortable for like ever but if you go in 80 Fahrenheit pool, you'll like start off being very warm, but quite quickly, you're going to get very, very cold. And the sperm whales and other like dolphins and whales are warm blooded animals like us. Like they have like a similar internal body temperature because of that in the ocean, uh, you can kind of like battle this by being bigger. So like the ratio of like how much your skin touches the water to how much uh, internal space you have the more skewed that is to like your body like this the ratio of being like less outside to more inside the more you'll be able to keep your heat so because of that dolphins and whales got much bigger so that they could like retain that heat and they also develop blubber uh, which is like a thick layer of fat that they have like all around their bodies let's draw some thick whales i think that's a good idea like throughout like in their body they have like their skin obviously at the top and then under the skin they have this like thick layer of what is called uh, blubber we'll like make it green and that's just like a very thick layer of fat that they have for insulation and uh, that's that's how you would write it so it's uh sorry my handwriting <laughs> blubber a lot of whales were hunted to like near extinction uh during the whaling era which is very sad we don't like that but the sperm whales, they haven't recovered. The humpback whales have recovered. Like they've done like an amazing recovery since people started whaling. Sperm whales, not so much. Um, and the big reason for that is that sperm whales have very long lives. So if we compare like a human life to a sperm whale life, it'd be surprisingly similar. So sperm whales live like around like 50 to 80 years on average, kind of like humans. 
uh, they have babies that are dependent on them for about five years, which is, you know, similar to humans. And on top of this, uh, with the sperm whale, and that's something we'll get in later on, uh, a lot of people are theorizing, and my, my supervisor uh, published a lot on this subject, that the reason why the sperm whales are not recovering as quickly as other animals is that they were socially disrupted by whaling. Grandmothers are extremely important for sperm whale societies. Like this grandmothers like have all the knowledge, they remember where the food is. If the weather changes, they'll remember like previous instances where the like the weather has changed and where they went in that case to get food. Like they're really, really important for the success of sperm whales. And that's the same thing in orcas. Uh, there's been a lot of research showing that like orca families that have older uh, grandmothers in their family unit are much more successful than those that don't have as old of grandmothers and that's because they have this like knowledge that they like share with the family so during whaling since a lot of grandmothers were killed a lot of males were killed the whales family units got disrupted and they still like haven't fully recovered from that and they lost like so so much knowledge during the whaling era that they haven't like learned back yet so that's one of the theory like this is a theory uh, but it's one of the theories of why sperm whales haven't recovered as well since the whaling era as other species of whale, which is kind of interesting. Okay, grandmas are OP. We, lo we love our grandmothers. They're amazing creatures. Like, they have, like, so much emotional intelligence. Um, they have so much, like, such strong social bonds and friendship. And that's something we'll get into because that was, like, a big part of my PhD. And that's like the biggest thing, like that's the thing that makes me so interested in whales and dolphins is that they're pretty much like an alien intelligence in the sea and they have those like strong friendships. They have those like family bonds and like those dramas and like those grudges with each other. And it's so interesting to like see that in a completely different environment that we like barely understand. So yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, why I like this. <laughs> I studied the, the whales. Uh, sperm whale brain are 22 pounds in comparison human brains are two pounds like they're gigantic brains um and what's going on in those brains you know like obviously some of that is used to like echolocate and like maintain this like sonar thing but like a lot of it is also used for social interactions and like remembering like things and remembering other whales and remembering like stuff which is really neat and their brain is also way way bigger than the other types of whales so like if we go back to like this uh map of like a poster of all the cetaceans in the world like sperm whales even though they're smaller than blue whales uh, their brain is actually much bigger so even though they're not the biggest of whale they have the biggest of brain and they actually have the biggest brain of any animal that has ever lived which is really cool they use that big brain of theirs just like we use our big brain of ours to uh survive everywhere on earth in the ocean of course sperm whales actually uh live in all of the world's ocean from the caribbean sea to the arctic and antarctic they're in the indian ocean the pacific ocean the atlantic ocean they're everywhere like they are the most wildly distributed species so like the species that has like the biggest range of any like other animal in the world with humans and orcas like a lot of people have like asked themselves like why are sperm whales and orcas and humans able to like survive in all those different types of environment like what makes them able to do this while most of other animals are not able to do this and uh, the first reason is their powerful nose so as i said earlier like they had this like crazy tool uh this crazy sonar that's like the most powerful sonar ever that big nose that is like super unique and no other animal <laughs> has like that big of a nose. <laughs> so they have this like super tool that allows them to like dive really deep in the ocean and eat all the squid that other dolphins and other whales, like most other dolphins and whales, are not able to eat. So they're like super efficient at getting food. Even if you're super smart and you go to this new place, if there's no food, like you, you're gonna die. <laughs> They need their snacks. They have that big nose. Sick. We love it. But a lot of animals are really adapted to the environment they live in. A lot of animals, like, you know, like sharks have those, like, crazy, like, teeth and jaws. And, like, those, like, chemo reception things. And, like, they can, like, sense the environment. They smell a drop of blood and, like, a bucket. And, like, they're, like, a lot of animals have those, like, 
superpower tools or like there's like crazy adaptation to like be very good hunters but they're not like all around the world able to survive everywhere like why are sperm whales able to do that and the second part of this answer is that on top of having this like crazy tool they also have um a very strong social structure like they also have this like social structure system that allows them to like communicate with each other that allows them to learn from each other and adapt together to situations and adapt to different environments socially kind of like how humans did like we didn't adapt to different environments by you know totally changing our biology like the big part of why humans are successful is our communities it's our ability to communicate with each other so now uh, we're gonna go in and we're gonna see how sperm whales communicate with each other so I actually have a few sounds of sperm whales for you guys. <laughs> They're all sounds that I recorded myself, so there is no copyright here. They're mine. They're my whales. <laughs> They're my sounds. <laughs> so uh, you guys will see the... Uh, I'll, I'll stop the music just so that you guys can hear um, the different sounds that sperm whale makes. So there's four different main categories of the sounds that sperm whale makes. The first one is echolocation which is the sound that they make when they're hunting, right? This, this like sonar sound. So how does that work is that through their big nose, the whales send out those like clicks. They're sending a click. And then when the click come back, they get information. So they're just kind of like sending this into the world to like see the world and like get information on what's going on. So the big tale of echolocation, like how you can know that what you're listening to is echolocation is that it's super regular. So it's like always like the same rhythm. It doesn't like start or end really. It's just kind of like constant. Like that's how they see, right? You can kind of like see it as like blinking. It's like you like you're sending the slick into the world. You're getting a still image and then you're sending another one, getting this still image. So you're like, you need to like constantly send it to be able to see the world. I do like to think that the whales approve of this presentation, but I don't know. <laughs> so echolocation. So this it's gonna sound like almost like a crackling fire because you need to remember like sperm whales they have those big communities they're super social so like it's really rare that sperm whales are alone and there'll be more on that later so when you hear echolocation often there's multiple whales echolocating at once so it can almost sound like it sounds like snapping shrimp if anybody has ever heard that and it also almost sounds like crackling fire so i'm gonna play it now and what you're gonna hear is echolocation so in this case there's multiple whales but you can hear those like click and it's constant like it like just like will keep going they'll go at it for like hours and hours and hours like it's really really rare like it almost never happens that whales will not be echolocating um like barely ever happens because that's how they see, right? Like, it's kind of like, it's really, really rare that you just have, like, your eyes closed and walking around. <laughs> I'll go into more details about how I study them. But pretty much, I follow them from a sailboat with a hydrophone <laughs> and a camera. I was in the presence of sperm whales and, like, following them for 900 hours. <laughs> like, that is so creepy. <laughs> and we didn't follow the same group for 900 hours. Like, we do usually stay one day with a group of whale and then we leave them uh we are like super careful in not disturbing the whale i mean like we're scientists like we want to learn about the whales but we don't want to disturb them at all so usually we'll like find whales spend a day with them and then we'll let them go and like find another group of whales spend a day with them and then i like, keep going uh we do find the same families uh over like years you know like you'll encounter the same group of whales over like in different times but we don't like follow the same group for like 900 hours now, the second sound uh, that they make is called a clang. And this is pretty much just like one super loud click. <laughs> that's it. It's just one very loud click. And the thing that's very interesting about the clang is that it's only made by mature males. So like old male sperm whales. They're the only one that make it. If there's only females around, you won't hear it. Uh, babies don't make it, adolescents don't make it, it's only large mature males that make the sound. And it is so loud, 
so loud, um, you can hear it from like super far away. So in this clip, there's going to be echolocation in the background, because once again, every time there's sperm oil, you hear them echolocate. But on top of the echolocation, so on top of that like little like crackling fire sound, you hear like one like clang. It's just like one like loud click. And I chose a clip that's not too loud, because <laughs> it can be like very intense <laughs> if it's close to you. So those were like the one like loud click that was like interspersed through it that I tried to like show with like my head. <laughs> They're like just like one click. They don't really have any like rhyme or reason. Like while the echolocation is like super regular, the clients will kind of like be interspersed throughout it all. And they're a big tail uh, that there's a male in the vicinity. But yeah, we have no idea what why they do that. <laughs> I, I like to think that it's to like announce themselves. Now the third category of sounds that whales make, sperm whale make, are creaks. So those are called creak because uh, they sound like a creaking door. Once again, very, uh, you know, very on it. <laughs> With creaks, uh, the way creaks are used is when whales are coming very close to their prey. So like whales will be echolocating, so they're sending those like regular like thing, like clicks. And then when they come close to the squid, they'll start creaking. So like. A creak is pretty much just like a very fast echolocation. It's like a little burst of echolocation. And the sperm will use it to like get like a very clear picture of whatever they're hunting. Yeah, it's high resolution, exactly. So they like, that is a thing that scientists also use because uh, if you only listen to the whales and if you hear creaks, it means that they're like honing on on the prey or they're like, they have a reason to like want better resolution of what they're seeing. <laughs> um, but also, What's very interesting about creek is that not only do they use them when they're hunting, but they also use them when they're socializing. So when whales are at the surface and they're socializing with each other and maybe they're like rubbing onto each other and like chatting and stuff, sometimes they'll creak through it. Uh, we don't know what it means when they use creek when they socialize. It could have like another like hidden meaning that we don't know. Or it could just be so that they get like a very picture of each other as they're talking to each other pretty much but they use it differently. So if they're hunting, they'll like echolocate normally, then they'll creak once or twice, and then they'll go back to echolocate normally. So like, it's assumed that they either like caught their prey or like the prey escaped, but they don't have need for it anymore. But when they socialize, they'll just like put it in there. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting. Let's listen to those, uh, those creaks. So it'll be like a is like kind of what it sounds like. It'll be like, you'll have once again, the echolocation in the back, and then it's going to be like a little, a little creek. So yeah, so it's kind of like those like, like those are the creeks. And that's like a clip during which the whales were socializing. So you can hear like multiple whales creaking at each other, right? So like some creeks were like closer, some creeks were a bit farther. So that was a, 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 a moment where there are multiple whales around and they were like kind of like creaking back and forth. So yeah, like the whales, they don't make whistles at all. Like all their social like communication and their like hunting communication and everything they communicate, it's all clicks. So the last category of sound that sperm whale makes, and that is the most interesting of all the categories, and that is codas. So codas are the sounds that whales make when they're socializing with each other. So echolocation is when they're hunting, clangs are by males, old males, creaks are when they're holding on the prey or when they want like a high D definition of whatever they're doing. So whales don't sing, they don't sing. They don't make whistles, they literally just click. And then when they're socializing with each other, so when they're with, the, with their friends, when they're with their families, when they're like hanging out, they do codas. 
And this is, in my opinion, the most interesting because once again, I'm interested in how they organize their societies, how they interact with each other. And codas are three to 12 clicks. So they have a beginning and an end. And they also have a pattern. And the pattern can be extremely different. Um, so we can think kind of, of codas as Morse code. I think that is like a very good analogy is how different number of clicks and a different rhythm will be a different coda. And they're almost like little, like almost words that the whales will like put in sequence with each other. They like answer to each other as well. And it can get like super complicated. So for example, it could be click, 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 click. Or it could be click, 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 click. Or it could be click, click. So in all those cases, there's a beginning and an end. There is a pattern. It's not just like all regular. If it is regular, like this one, it'll like, it won't keep going. Like it'll be like contained. And they will often be made in sequence with each other. Codas come in a lot of different types. So there's over like a hundred different types of codas that have been heard in the Caribbean alone. So like in this case, like those are three different examples. But later on, I'll show you guys even more examples of those. And we don't know exactly what they mean, obviously, but we know that they are used when the whales socialize with each other. So I'll play it. Um, they're a bit trickier to catch, especially the first clip, but I'll try to point it out. We'll be hearing this coda, which is uh, 1 plus 1 plus 3. So as scientists, we name codas based on their rhythm. So this is like 1 click plus 1 click plus 3 clicks. Uh, this would be like a five regular because it's five regularly spaced clicks. Uh, but in the clip we're about to hear, we'll hear the one plus one plus three, which is click, 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 click. So you'll hear the echolocation in the back, which is like this constant, like crackling fire, like thing. And then on top of it, you'll hear click, 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 click. And then there'll be a pause and then they'll do it again. So that'll be the first click. If you don't get it, let me know. I'll try to point to it as we hear it. So you could hear this one, it was a bit faint, but it was like you had the echolocation in the back and then you could hear click, 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 click on top. Were you, was anyone able to catch it? I love those. Yeah, is it, yeah. so that's like, in this case, you have like whales echolocating in the back and then on top of it, they're communicating socially with each other, like making that coda. For my PhD, uh, I went through those 900 hours of recorded sperm whales and I would just like in 30 second chunks, like I had an Excel sheet that like went on forever. I would just like listen to the whales and like mark like yes or no are their codas in this like 30 second chunk. Very, very time consuming. A lot of work. And now we're going to listen to like actual sperm whales socializing. So it's going to be a melting pot of all those sounds. But you can very much tell the codas in them because you'll see that the whales will like answer codas back to each other. So it's not going to feel like a regular like click, click, click. Click, click. It's going to be like very much like pattern clicks sending back and forth to each other and some creaks in there. So let's hear. <laughs> this is what a whale party sounds like.
yeah, so there was lots in there, uh, and that was a lot of different codas, right? Like we had like the click, 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 click. We also had like click, 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 click. We had like some like. Then especially I couldn't do nine hundred hours. So. Yeah, so that's when whales are socializing with each other. So they're making different types of codas. They're answering to each other. They're like making them one on top of the other. Like we don't really understand how that works, <laughs> but that means that they're socializing. Like they're obviously like talking to each other. And I don't know um, if what I just shared with you guys is safe for work. Uh, I hope that it is, <laughs> but I have no idea. So if there's any well in the chat, I'm sorry if I offended you or if I like kind of like gave some of their like secret family recipes or something, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah if we go back that's their sperm whale biggest brain in the world they live in all of the world's ocean and the reason why they're so successful is that they have this like big old nose that they're able to that they use to like hunt for squid like super successfully and then on top of that they have this like complex network of like family and friends that they can like learn from and communicate with so that's what we're gonna go see next is um, the social structure of sperm whale. So uh, the first, like the first big division in sperm whale world is between male and female. So male and female sperm whale have completely different lives, like full on. There is a lot of sexual dimorphism. So while female sperm whales will like max out at around like 10 to 12 meters, the males can go all the way up to 20 meters. They're huge. <laughs> They're huge. So there's a lot of sexual dimorphism and there's a lot of social uh, differences between male and female sperm whales. So the females will stay in the warm waters all year round. They don't migrate. On the other hand, when like a male sperm whale reach about like 8 to 12 years old, so when they become teenagers, the male will like leave their families. They'll leave their, the female and they'll slowly make their way, their way up north. So the light blue um, areas here are the areas where male sperm whales live. And when the males leave their family unit, at first they'll form a little gangs, <laughs> which are called bachelor schools. So it'll be like a bunch of like different males will kind of like stay together and like make their way north slowly. But as they get older, they get bigger and bigger and they get less and less social. So by the time they're like all the way in the Antarctic and all the way up north, they're gigantic and solitary. And then 15 years later, when they're in their late 20s and 30s, they'll go back south to reproduce. So they actually kind of go on this like crazy pilgrimage. And we know so little about this. Like there is literally so little information about how, why males leave. Like, are they getting kicked out of their families? Are they choosing to leave? Uh, when do they know to come back? We don't know. Do they come back to their families? Or do they go to, like, somewhere else? We have no idea. We literally don't know anything. But we know that they move a lot. So one of the whales that I've seen, uh, one of the males that I've seen in the Caribbean, uh, so right here, <laughs> right here, uh, traveled from the Caribbean to Iceland. Like that is a lot of ocean for one whale to go through. So in some areas of the world, you can only see male sperm whales. So in Nova Scotia, um, you can see sperm whales, but you only see males. And same thing in, in BC, actually where I am now. And in other parts of the world, so you can see mostly females, so like in the Caribbean, but also males on top of it. So it really depends where you are in the world, what you're gonna see. But the big tell as to whether you're seeing a male or a female sperm whale is a are there other whales around? If there's lots of other whales around, it's a female group, it's a family of females. If it's alone or in pairs, it's probably a male. Um, but it could, and if it's really big, it's probably a male. And also they make those like clang sounds, right? It's really hard to follow the male sperm whales because they're in like such crazy open ocean. We don't really understand their movements. So how we know that like the same whale goes one way or another is just based on like lucky photos. So what about the female social structure? So we know that the males leave, they form those little gangs of other male sperm whales, and then they become solitary. But the females that stay in the warm water year round, they have some dramas. <laughs> let me tell you, they have some dramas. So let's, let's see 
what the social life of a female sperm whale looks like and that includes also like young males like as i said the, the males only leave when they're teenagers so young males also like follow this social structure and then the females follow this social structure their entire lives so here you have your sperm whale but as i said if you're a female sperm whale you're never going to be alone uh, and that's because sperm whales are matrilineal which means that females will stay with their mothers and their grandmothers and their aunts their entire life, forming matrilines. So if you're a female sperm whale, you'll literally live with your mom and your grandmother your whole life. Like you'll always be within each other's hearing range, which is about eight kilometers. But beyond that, one or two matriline of sperm whales, so one or two family families of sperm whales, so like, you know, like genetic family, will be part of what we call a social unit. So this is the basal structure of sperm whale families. Like this is like the core unit. Sperm whales that are part of the same social unit will always be seen together. Like if we like as scientists, like if we come into an area and we see like one individual of a social unit we know, we can assume that all the other whales from that unit are there right now within hearing range. So like within that like eight kilometers. And if we don't see one of the whales, it's like really, really bad sign. Like it means like probably something like quite unfortunate has happened. They forage together, they socialize together, they travel together, they're like always, 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 always with each other. And that can be either one family or two families. On top of that, uh, social units will sometimes join up with other social units. So like uh, one family group joining up with another family group for a few hours, to a few days to form a group so we can think of groups as family friends so like you go eat with them for a bit you hang out with them for a bit but they're not like always 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 there and then on top of that and that's where the drama really begins we have in the same area you can have multiple social units so multiple of those families that are always together part of a vocal clan now a vocal clan can include like hundreds to thousands of whales like it doesn't mean like being part of a vocal clan doesn't mean that you know like every single whale in that vocal clan but instead it means that you'll only hang out with whales from your own vocal clan and you will avoid and not associate like not hang out with whales from different vocal clans even if you live in the exact same place and even if you encounter each other so families literally only hang out with families from their own vocal clan. Males leave the crazy female social structure when they're teenagers. And when they come back, they reproduce across vocal clan. So while the females don't hang out ever with other whales from different vocal clans, the males will reproduce with both. So the genetic diversity is the same for everyone like they're not different genetically from each other like they have the same genetic but there's this like cultural divide between them and now we can tell vocal clans apart is that they have different dialects so pretty much what's happening and like if we compare this in like the crudest form to humans is as if you lived in um in montreal which is like a city in canada and you have the french people only being friends with French people and only hanging out with French people and the English people only hang out with English people even though they live in the same street and in that case like in humans case like there's like a case to be said like well maybe they can't understand each other but in the case of sperm whales uh, we know that they share some of their dialect some of the codas that they use uh, so those sounds that they make socially are shared between the vocal clan but some of them, a few, aren't. <laughs> so there's specific codas that a vocal clan will make that is literally only heard from whales in that vocal clan. And we'll get more into that. It's like, if you make this like patterns of click, we'll hang out with each other. Like, even if I don't know you, it's like, okay, like we're part of the same thing, like gotcha. And if you don't make that sound, it's like, oh, you're part of that other gang? Like, no, thank you, I'm out. In the Caribbean, we have two different vocal clans of whales. The first one is the EC1 whales. EC stands for Eastern Caribbean. 
So yeah, Eastern Caribbean one. And uh, I have some recordings of those uh, clicks, so you guys can like hear the differences. So what it sounds like is click, 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 click. So in the back, you'll hear echolocation, which is going to be like a crackling sound of clicks, which the whales use to like see the world. And then on top of it, you'll hear click, 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 click. And that's like, once again, it's coda. That's like unique to that vocal clan. Yeah, so like there is three there. So like you could hear like the crackling fire, like the echolocation. And then on top of it, you can hear like the click, 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 click. Uh, the other vocal clan, EC2, they could easily make the sound. Like they, they could easily learn to make the sound, but they don't. Now we're going to listen to the coda, like the identity coda from the second vocal clan. So those are two vocal clans that, once again, they live in the same area. They've been seen at the exact same location on different days. But over in over like 15 years of research in the Caribbean, we've never seen or almost never seen whales from the clan EC1 with whales from the clan EC2. And the only thing that we can see that's different between them is that they make those different sounds. So instead of being click, 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 this one will be click, 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 click. So let's, let's listen. So instead of being like click, 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 it's click, 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 click. And as scientists, we can know uh, which vocal clan a whale is part of based on that exact sound. So if we're just like sailing around looking for whales and we hear click, 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 we know that the whales around us are from EC1. And if we're sailing around and we see whales and we hear the sound click, 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 then we know that they're EC2 whales and we know that they won't associate with each other which is really interesting and they're called identity codas because once again some patterns of click are made by all whales regardless of their vocal clown but other patterns of click like these two are made only by whales from a one vocal clown and those are called identity codas so yeah this is a very scary picture but I'm gonna break it down to you guys and if you don't understand all of it it's fine but this is just a depiction of the, what we knew of the sperm whale society in the Caribbean. So in this image, every dot, so like every like black dot is a whale. So like every like little splotch is like a, a whale. Then the black lines between them are all often they're seen together. So pretty much what it means is that if there's a tick line between two dots, it means that they're besties. And if there's no lines between two dots, it means they've never been seen together. Now the circles are those family units, right? They're the social units. So they're like those whales that are like always, always seen together. Like they're the core structure of those ones. Uh, you have like the unit T, which is like the family T. So like all the whales from that unit. You have unit V, which are all the whales from another unit. And like the letters are just arbitrary. They're just for us to like keep track of who's who. So in this case, you can see that unit F and unit U are very like good friends. On the other hand, unit F and unit T, they've never been seen together. Like they don't care for each other. They don't hang out. This is researched by Dr. Shane Gero from the Dominica Spermal Project. It is not my research yet. The white dots are males. A few besties, of course, I know. It's like amazing. So like the families are given like names alphabetically. So like the first family that they found was given name A and then there was like family B and stuff. And uh, but it's kind of amazing that the family F and U became besties in the end, because like that was not planned and I love it. <laughs> so uh, we can recognize sperm whales and I'll go into this in more details based on their flukes. So their tails are unique. So every sperm whale has a completely unique tail. So based on that, you can, um, you can like identify an individual, so, which is like what you get like the dots from. Like those are all like the individuals. And then you can get their family 
based on all the other whales that are in the same area on the same day over multiple years. So as I said, like whales from the same family are always together. They're always within hearing range of each other. So if you have like those like five individuals that you can identify based on photos, they're always together every time you see them, then you know that they're a family. But overall, like within the vocal clans, which are the colors, they're, they're all interconnected. And then overlaid on this is the purple lines, which the purple lines is all similar the vocal sounds of the whales are. And what you can see here is that whales from the same vocal clan, so this like cultural group, all have very similar sounds. So it's like very thick purple lines, but between vocal clans, so like between EC1 and green and EC2 and red, they never hang out and they sound very different. So this is just like a very complex photo to pretty much say that there's social segregation. There's like a cultural segregation between the whales and whales that speak differently, don't hang out with each other and they obviously sound different. And people have discovered vocal clans in the Pacific, the Caribbean, in Brazil, in Mauritius, in Japan. Like it seems like vocal clan is kind of the social structure of whales worldwide. So like even in different areas of the world, like they all kind of like follow this rule of like whales that have different dialect don't hang out with each other. Like if like a vocal clan is a cultural group, like what 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 is culture? You know, like it's kind of like a word that like we know, but it's kind of hard to define. So here's the definition that I used in my PhD. Culture can be defined as behavior or information shared within a community that is acquired from conspecific through some form of social learning. So this is like a big academia definition. Pretty much the only two main things that matter about this is that culture needs to be something that is shared. So like if you just have like if you just do something really weird and the you're the only person that does that, that does not qualify as culture. And it needs something that you learn socially. So it's like not something that is like a result of like an instinct or a genetic behavior. It needs to be something that you learn socially from someone else. And like what I'm saying, like learn socially learning, it's not only like having someone tell you like, this is how we do it. It's also like being able to like observe other people and be like, okay, this is accepted. This is not accepted. Everybody here is dressing this way or everybody here is saying this thing. So I'm going to dress this way or say this thing. Like a lot of it is just like observing others, but it's still social, right? Because you're still like socially like interacting with a, a person that's doing an action. Culture is everywhere. Like human culture is absolutely everywhere. Um, like literally everything in the human world is culture. Like the way we dress is cultural. The way like our languages are obviously culture. Uh, the things we eat are cultural, the way we speak, like our accents are cultural group, the way uh, that we behave with each other is culture, like every, like literally so much of our lives is like defined by our culture. And you can have multiple cultures, right? Like, so for example, like I'm part of the culture of streamers, you know, like I'm part of a stream community that has a certain culture, but I'm also Canadian. And I'm also French Canadian and I'm also like part of like, you know, like the climbing culture because I climb like there's like there's like multiple like you don't have to be only part of a single cultural group like you are part of like multiple like nested cultures. Yeah, fish like I know like people speak different languages like they eat different foods like I don't need to have a PhD to know that like you've wasted four years of your life. <laughs> but. The reason why I'm really interested in the topic of culture and especially the topic of culture in sperm whales is because the topic of culture is still like very controversial in non-human animals. Like a lot of people are still like very cold to the idea of having animals being able to like learn from each other, like having the ability to have those different dialects, having those different behaviors. And it's not just like instinct, right? Like often we think like, okay, like humans, everything we do, it's like we have intention. There's a reason why we do it. We learn it from others. But with animals, it's like, oh yeah, it's instinct. It's like they're genetic. Like that's like they're programmed to do this. Like they're pretty much robots. And it's very not the case. So it's quite controversial still to talk about 
culture in animals. Like a lot of people still are very cold to the idea. Even though we have evidence of culture in our closest relatives, the chimpanzees, in the other great apes like the orangutan and the gorilla, in monkeys like capuchin monkeys, in dolphins, of course, and toothed whales like the sperm whale, in baleen whales like the humpback whale, in birds, there's a lot of evidence of culture in birds, a lot of evidence of culture in ungulates and so like big horn sheep. So this very much like anthropocentric view of the world where like humans are like the pinnacle of like the world and then like animals are like beneath us and they're just like not quite as smart as us or they're just like not the same as us and like oh like animals would never like think or like have emotions or culture like that's a human thing and it, it's, it's not it's not <laughs> and like there's evidence of culture in bees like there's evidence of cultures all around us like all like so many animals have cultures to an extent i mean it's not always as intricate as it is in humans but it's still there like it's still important to acknowledge it and it still like impacts the way that they behave and they live now let's talk about where i study sperm whales which is in the lesser antilles or the caribbean we're getting into my stuff now like this was like background information now we're getting into the phd so this is the caribbean uh the eastern caribbean this is what it looks like and uh this is the lesser antilles so at the top here you have saint kitts and nevis then you have montserrat guadeloupe dominica martinique uh, saint lucia saint vincent and the grenadines and then granada which are like islands in the caribbean and until my phd uh, the sperm oil research was done in Dominica, which is an island in the middle of the Lesser Antilles, and it was led by the Dominica Sperm Oil Project, which are collaborators on this PhD project as well, and they're fantastic. And for 15 years, the Dominica Sperm Oil Project has studied sperm oils in Dominica. So like they've been here like every year, they go out, they look for whales, and they just like gather that data. And that's where we got like that diagram from earlier. But for my PhD, I actually extended that area to englobe all of the Lesser Antilles. So the lines that you see on this map are actually the transects that I followed on my boat. So pretty much like I was sailing a boat on these lines back and forth until I found whales. And then when I found whales, I would like gather information on them. So we went from one island to all these islands. So we like greatly expanded what we were looking at. And I did that over two years. So in 2019 and 2020, I did eight two week surveys. So I would go like at sea two weeks at a time, go look for whales and come back, get water and then get back out. So I did that eight times. So this is the sailboat that I used. And this is St. Lucia here, which is the port that we uh, launched from. Uh, when we're at sea, we do 24 seven monitoring of whales. So we're like, we have like shifts and people wake up and we try to like look, we like look visually for whales, but more importantly, we listen for them. So as we're sailing along, we like carry this like big hydrophone. I'm there, that's me. <laughs> and these two pixels are me right there. Every 30 minutes, we go down on the boat, we listen, and then if we hear sperm whale sounds, we try to track them. Uh, but pretty much we're stalking whales, as we said earlier. And uh, this is how we do it. So here's our boat here. So we have like a little sailboat here. And at the back of our boat, we have this long 100 meter long cable that we're like towing, towing behind us. And at the end of this cable is a hydrophone, which is like just like pretty much like a mic, an underwater mic. And we're recording from this mic all the time. And what's very important about this mic is that it actually has two mics on it. One at the front and one at the back. And then that's recording on like a computer that's like running on the boat. Now, when we hear sperm whales or any other whales, we can tell where they are based on where the sound is coming from. So here, let's say that the sound is purple. If the whales are in front of the boat, this is a whale, it's beautiful. And they're making sounds like this, like in this, like in all directions, this microphone will pick up the sound first on the other hand if the whales are behind us here and they're making sounds once again this hydrophone will pick it up first 
So pretty much based on like the, this layout, we can know whether the whales are in front or behind us. So based on that, we can either like keep going or we can like backtrack. When we hear whales, we like get on them based on like those directions, so like front or behind. And then we follow, if we find them at night, we'll follow them all night because we can't take photos. We'll follow them all night. And then when the sun rises, we'll start taking photos of them. Because once again, you can tell um, a whale's identity based on its tail because they're all unique. And then we'll spend the whole day with them. And then after, once we spend like a whole day with a whale, then we leave. And then we go back on those, um, on those like little transects and keep going to find another family of whales. So yeah, when we study whales, what we do is uh, we take GPS. So like while we're sailing up and down, and this is like the actual like, gps of our boat so when i was like that's all like like the lines like the you know like when you go for a run and you're like apple watch shows you the run that you did that was my phd version of that <laughs> we also record the whale so that's once again a photo of me working so that's like the software that shows us the clicks and whether they're in the front or in the back of the boat that's what a hydrophone looks like so this like this like microphone that we put in the water and yeah, so we're just like pretty much like towing this big old thing and the whales are being recorded on it. And then we record it from the computer. And finally, we identify the whales based on their flukes. So every sperm whale tail is unique. So in this case, what we do is when the whales are at the surface, they're breeding. And when they're at the surface, you can only see their back, kind of like that first photo that I shot. But when they go to forage, so when they go to eat, they like arch their back, show their tail and dive, right? Because they're like going very deep in the ocean. And when they do that, if we take a photo of their tail, we can identify the specific whale that it is because every tail is absolutely unique. So for example, this is one tail, this is another one, and yet another one, and yet another one. So not only are the shapes of the tail different, but they also have little chunks taken out of them. Uh, for example, like this one has like an open uh, middle, this one is closed. So you can like tell them apart over like multiple years. Like this one has like this part missing. And that way you can like recognize which wells it is. So you can like track them over like years, over months uh, using this. And over like a lot of like the world, like a lot of distances. These like low marks can be caused by different things. So some of them are caused by other sperm whales, like when they're like socializing and like uh, others can be caused by dolphins or pilot whales or other like marine mammals that like can be like biting them sometimes for unknown reason caused by human like fishing gear. Uh, so for example, like this was probably a propeller cut. Uh, orcas also eat sperm whales in the Caribbean. I've seen that firsthand. So... <laughs> Um, so some of those marks could also be from orca attacks that the whales survive. But it's really rare that the whales has a clean fluke by the time it's an adult. Now let's get into this. My PhD. When I started my PhD, this is what we knew. So I started from this like large data set that was like gathered over 15 years of research in Dominica by the Dominica Spermal Project. Shout out Shane, we love you. <laughs> 250 sperm whales in the area that they knew were from 21 different families. And they had identified two vocal clans, so two like groups of whales that had different dialects that didn't hang out with each other. And those were EC1 and EC2 for Eastern Caribbean 1 and Eastern Caribbean 2. And those are the ones that we listened to earlier. Now, when I came in, the objective of my PhD was to first understand how vocal clans interact in the Lesser Antilles. So from the Dominica research, they knew that there were two vocal clans, but one of them, EC1, was very well known and often encountered. And the second one was very much a mystery. Like they only knew two families from the second vocal clan. In fact, until like, like 2016, they had no idea the Red Clan existed. Like they assume it was just the green clan around Dominica. And then they discovered the red clan and they're like, wait a minute, there's another clan here. Like it was like very much like a mystery clan. 
so I came in and I was like, this is cool. Like, I want to understand, like, who are those whales? Like, do they have different behaviors? Like, what's their deal? Like, what's the red clans deal? Like, we know nothing about them. Like, let, let's investigate. And uh, in order to investigate that, I was like, well, if that clan is never found around Dominica, maybe we need to increase where we're looking, right? So, like, what's in the white square here is the research area of uh, around Dominica. And then for my PhD, I actually did research around all of this, like where the lines are. I was like, we need to find that red clan. We need to figure out not only what's their deal, but how do the red clan and the green clan interact with each other in the Lesser Antilles. My second objective was to understand how different they were from each other. So we know that they are different dialects. They make different sounds. But are there other differences between them, right? Because as we said earlier, like being part of a cultural group is not only like the way you speak, but it can also be the way you dress, the things you eat, your so like the way you interact with other people. Like what are the like social norms of this like newer clan that we know nothing about? Our animal culture impact animal lives. Uh, because once again, that's still like a fairly controversial topic. And I, I kind of like wanted to make like a big statement that it shouldn't be controversial and it's most definitely happening. So I have like a concrete example of like that is how like this like cultural clan divide affects sperm whale behavior. I wanted to show that culture does matter for conservation and we'll go back on this uh, later. But how it's important to recognize that animals have those cultural groups so that we can protect them better. So now we're getting into my big brain findings. First and foremost, what I found was that there are way more whales in the Caribbean than we first thought. For 15 years, the Dominica Sperm Whale Project goes out, they take photos of whales, and over 15 years, they see 250 whales. In two years, I discovered 147 new whales. So I almost doubled the total number of whales that we knew in the Caribbean in just two years, which is wild. And on top of this, those 147 new whales are part of 23 new families. Why is that? Like, our protocols are the same. Like, what is happening here? And this is what it looks like, right? So, like, that's like the total number of whales found over time. So, like, starting in the 1990. And then we can see that the two years that I did research, it's like kind of plateauing before then. And then my research is like, pew, like there's way more than we thought. Now, if we look, and this is very scary picture, like I will break it down, guys. I promise I will break it down. We will make it true. I promise. <laughs> so this is kind of like when we break down the dialects of those whales, right? Because we had all those new whales. Like what kind of sounds are they making? Like we need to understand every line is a day with a family of whales so like that's just like this line for example it's me on my boat with a family of whales for a full day so that's like the vertical of it and that's just like the like scary graph at the top is like how similar they are to each other so for example like these two days whales made very similar sounds like it sounded almost the same and that's like just the name of the units right so like this day was with unit like family f this day was with family f and u this day was with family a this day was with family t so like that's just like the name of the families at the bottom the horizontal lines are the actual sounds so for example when the whales make click 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 or click 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 or click 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 so that's just like the patterns of sounds that they're making the shading is how often they made those sounds. So for example, on this day, they made a lot of this sound. So it's like dark gray or like very little of this sound. Here on this graph, uh, you can see the first two clans, the green clan, which make the sounds click, 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 click. And also a slower version, like click, 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 click. And then the red clan, which makes the sound click, 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 click. And what you can see here is that when you're part of the same clan, you make a lot of those sounds and barely any of the other sounds. But also a new clan, EC3, which I discovered that makes new sounds, which are very long, fast codas. 
and this vocal plan is very weird they're very weird so there's still like quite a bit of controversy as to whether or not they should be uh, recognized as a clan because they're a single family of whale so usually vocal clans like the ec1 and ec2 there's multiple families in them uh, ec3 we only found one family but they're still like very consistently over the two years that i did research making the same sounds and not making the other sounds so it's really interesting and i'm gonna let you guys listen to those new whales which i love they're my favorite <laughs> i discovered them a lost culture so this clan like what the codas sound like is click 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 like you'll see like it's like very click quick clicks so let's listen that's the engine okay that's the codas So yeah, so that's what it sounds like. So it's like those like, there's the engine in the back a bit, then you have the echolocation, and then there's a like tick, 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 tick. <laughs> exactly. So they sound super different than the other whales, which is cool. If they've studied whales for 15 years in Dominica, how come they never A, encountered that third vocal clan in 15 years? And like, as I said, like, it's not that my methods were better or I was a better scientist, like far from that. We had like the exact same protocol, it was the exact same, like, we're part of the same research group, like, it's not that I was, like, had, like, a special something that came in, like, it's literally, we did something that allowed us to find all those other whales. And maybe the most important of my discovery is that vocal clans have very different distribution in the Eastern Caribbean. They just live around different islands. Because research was mostly done around Dominica, they mostly encountered EC1 whales. Even though, for a whale to swim from Dominica to Martinique would only take a couple of hours. And we know Pacific sperm whales move thousands of kilometers and they, like, they're quite nomadic. In the Caribbean, sperm whales stay around the same island. So the whales that we encounter in Dominica are different than the whales in Guadeloupe. They're different than the whales in St. Kitts. And they're different than the whales in St. Vincent. Like, as soon as we would sail into Dominica, we would find all the whales that we already knew. And then as soon as we sailed out of Dominica, it'd be all new whales. There's like EC1 families that had never been seen before that we found in St. Vincent and St. Kitts. And that also explained why that red clan, or like the EC2 whales, were super rare in Dominica. Because they live in Martinique and St. Lucia, where people were not studying them before. Beige is the Caribbean. The gray is the movement of sperm whale in the Pacific. Every like day, they move hundreds of kilometers. And over years, they move thousands of kilometers. Since we didn't know about the Caribbean, when they started the research in Dominica, they just assume the same and because they can, sperm whales from Dominica would move hundreds of kilometers and thousands of kilometers as they do in the Pacific. Why not? Like, it makes sense. Like, they can do it. We know that whales do that. So why wouldn't they? But they didn't. In fact, in the Caribbean, which we can see in beige here, they barely move at all. They're not ocean nomads, they're island specialists. Our assumption was wrong. We assumed that the whales in Dominica were like a good sample size for the Caribbean, and it wasn't. And on top of that, because the vocal clans have very different islands that they live off of, that means that EC3 and EC2 had never been seen in Dominica before, because only, or like mostly, EC1 whales are off of Dominica. I'm showing that your cultural group, so like the vocal clan you belong to, is really important. It like really affects your behavior and it affects where you live as a sperm whale. So the idea is that if you're a Pacific whale and you're born in a Pacific whale family, you learn from your mother, you learn from your grandmother, you learn from your family that we move. Like, you know, every day we make, we make it happen. We swim those hundred kilometers, like we eat that squid and we like keep moving around. Like we have this like knowledge of the entire area and we just like move through it. And like, that's the way we do things. But then if you're a sperm whale born in the Caribbean, you look the exact same. They're like, no, for us, we stay around that island. This is a good living. We have our friends here. We have our little life. We have our food. We don't need to go crazy. And that's the way we do it. 
So around the Galapagos, where a lot of the research was done in the Pacific, like the food might move around much more. So the whales have learned to move around to adapt to the food. While in the Caribbean, the food might be much more reliable off of the island. So the whales have like learned to stay off of the same island over multiple years or allowed them to have a more sedentary lifestyle. <laughs> but I was really interested when I saw this map and I was like, oh my God, this is wild. That why Martinique and St. Lucia, why Dominica, Guadeloupe, Antigua, St. Kitts and St. Vincent? Like why are the vocal clans only around, like segregated this way, right? Like, I mean, it means nothing, Dominica to those whales. Like it's a, a land, like they don't go on land. <laughs> why are they like only staying around the same island? Like, I don't get it. And why are like EC1 whales only around those islands and EC2 only around those islands? And at first I was like, oh, well, maybe they eat different things, you know, like, uh, but there's no difference as far as we know, which is like very little research. But as far as we know, as much as I could find, uh, there's no difference in squid species across the different islands. So they don't eat different things as far as we know. So then I looked into that a bit more. And especially it seemed very weird to me because like you have this weird little patch of EC1 here. Like it would make more sense that like that little patch in Martinique and then St. Lucia and Martinique be red. You know, like why is it like interspersed like that? It seems like annoying to like have to deal with those guys. You don't want to like see. So I had two main theories. First, that the different vocal clans were habitat specialists. What I mean by that is that maybe the green clan learned to hunt squid in underwater canyons. And like maybe the EC1 whales like were like, okay, this is our way of life. We hunt squid in the canyons. And they like came up with this like great strategy to hunt squid in the canyon. And there's way more canyons in Dominica and Guadeloupe than there are in Martinique and St. Lucia. So because of that, like because there's more canyons around those islands, that's the islands that they're around because they have this like specific foraging strategy. And then the red clan forage a different way. Like maybe they forage using like steep walls instead or like plains. And they have like another strategy and there's more plains in Martinique or St. Lucia. So that was the first theory that they use different environments to forage, like to hunt. The second hypothesis was that what we're seeing is a result of site fidelity. So in this case, the whales stay around the same island their whole life because that's the island where their family is. That's the island where they grew up. That's the island where they learn to forage regardless of how they do it. And that's the island where they know that all the other whales they encounter on that island will also be part of their same vocal clan of their same culture. So in order to test that, I did habitat models and I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of it here because it's really complicated, but pretty much I looked at a bunch of different environmental things that could be different between one island and the next to see if those like, you know, if the islands used by the red clan were different than the islands used by the green clan and like, okay, are there more canyons in the green islands? Are there less canyons in the Red Islands? Are there, is the current faster? Are there like more, um, like is it more turbulent? Is it less turbulent? And what I found is that there's actually no real difference between the islands that are used by the Green Clan and the Red Clan. They're kind of the same. And because of that, it's most likely that those differences in distribution are like entirely cultural. It's like literally like this is our neighborhood and this is where we live and therefore you shall live here as well. Often when people talk about animals, it's like they follow their food. But in this case, it's yes, they follow their food. But on top of that, they have this like cultural difference that also impacts where they are. So what could have happened is, um, and this is all speculation, but let's say you're EC1 whales and you just move to the Caribbean from somewhere else. You come here, you start having your own dialect because you're like unique and you're all part of this family. And then maybe you stay around Dominica because there's like food reliably there. It's great. Then 
another group of whale from another location, or maybe from the same location, but like thousands of years apart, come in and they see all those whale that like have this dialect around Dominica. And they're like, we don't like that. Those are not like us. We have a different dialect. So they go to Martinique where there's like no whales and they start having their own dialect. That's a possibility. So it's like multiple like waves of immigration, pretty much. Another alternative hypothesis is that clans are branching off from each other. So, and that's what I think is happening maybe with the EC2 clan. So you have the red clan that like made a living in Martinique and St. Lucia. They're living their best life. It's great. And then you have this one family that's like a bit of a counterculture family. And they're just like, you know what? We're done with you guys. We're starting our new thing. And then they start click, 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 click. <laughs> The yellow clan lives in the same island as the red clan as of now. And there's only one family of the yellow clan. So it's possible that the yellow clan is like actively branching off from the red clan. We have no idea. We have no idea. All we have is that we know that the red clan and yellow clan are in the same location. I've seen them together one day, which is really weird because usually vocal clans are never seen together. And I did see those two whales in the same area on the same day. Their dialect is a bit more similar. So they both have regular clicks. So like while the green clan is like click, 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 click. So there's like a rhythm to it. Both the red and yellow clan is more like of a regular thing. It's just the yellow clan is like longer and faster. But we don't know. Like the answer to this is just keep studying and seeing what happens over like decades and decades and decades. And that's also why we have no answers for this. And all of this is just my own hypotheses. And there's like literally no proof for it. Yeah, yellow clan is pretty high. They're pretty high. My fourth discovery, and this one is a bit more convoluted, so bear with me, is that uh, identity codas, so those like patterns of click that are like unique to that one cultural group, so like the sound that like allow us to differentiate between the green and the red clan, are a symbol to the whales. So it's like something that they're like broadcasting with the intention of being, I'm part of that group. Right, so that's like going into the psychology of the whales. Like, is it just a random thing that they say that happens to match their social? Or is it like actually a signal that they're like intentionally like broadcasting out to be like, I'm part of the green clan or I'm part of the red clan and this is who I am. So that's called a symbolic marker. So it's like a symbol that delineate and maintain cultural group boundaries. So for example, uh, example of symbolic markers are accents. Uh, religious symbols so for example a cross for christianity can be a flag a flag is a symbolic marker so in order to study that uh, i look at the like the shape of those clicks and if they are symbols we would expect the clicks like the patterns of click that are related to like the group identity to be stereotyped so you would make them uh, very consistently, like you wouldn't make mistakes making them. Like if it's a symbol, it needs to be like very easily identified and it needs to be made reliably. Like if you make, like you draw a flag, you need to draw it well. Like if you mix the colors, like it could have very grave repercussions, you know? The whales would make that sound more reliably than they would make other sounds. Don't have as much creative liberties with it because it's associated with a cultural group the second one is that they would be redundant um, so that means that they would make them often and they would make them the same and finally they would be discrete which means that they need to be very different from each other so if you have two symbols that look the same they're likely to be confounded for each other so you need to have the click pattern sound as different as you can or like at least different enough from each other so that they can be confused. Like you cannot like hear a green clan sound and be like, oh, is that green clan or red clan? You need to know right away. Like it needs to be like, oh yes, that's like definitely those guys. And this is another very scary figure that we're gonna go through. So the numbers are the coda type. So whether it's like click, 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 a click or like click, 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 click. So it's like the pattern. And what we can see here 
uh, is all the different times that that click type was made. So all the different 32s here, all the different like whatever, like you kind of lose them, but the different colors are all the different times that we've heard that thing. And then the circles around them. So it's like kind of like the shape of the coda in like language space, <laughs> which is super abstract. But what we can see very clearly is that identity codas, so the codas, like those sounds that are specific to a single vocal clan, so like specific to the green clan or the red clan or the peach clan or pink clan, are much smaller than the gray, the gray codas, which are the codas that are made by, like that don't have this like cultural significance. They are made much more accurately than other coda types. So like if you make the coda 32, which is like whatever, a click, 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 you can be way less accurate when you make it. Like it doesn't matter too much. But if you make the vocal clan one, you need to be like very precise. Like you are way more precise when you do it. And that means that if they're spending all this energy to like say something very accurately, it probably has more meaning. At least that's what I'm assuming. We can also see that the colored cluster overlap way less with each other than the gray clusters do. So like the gray clusters, like they're all on top of each other, which means that they could be confounded with each other. Like they could be confused, like they sound similar. But the colored ones, they're all like very much away from the other colored ones, which means that they sound very different. So both of those things like mean that they could be used. Um, they could be used for identity. So that brings me to my final big discovery for my PhD. And that's something that is very close to my heart is that um, culture. So this idea that the sperm whales are learning from each other, learning, learning from their mothers, they're learning from their grandmothers, their aunts, their families matters a lot for conservation. And it matters that we acknowledge that animals, like even beyond the sperm whales, have this like cultural aspect to their life. That might mean that they, you know, like that their population is divided because of cultural differences and might mean that they live in different places for cultural reasons, even though they have the same genetics and they eat the same thing. Uh, that matters for conservation. Like we need to acknowledge that if we want to protect those whales properly. Because right now, uh, all of the world's conservation policies, apart from a very few, are based on genetic populations and species. So pretty much you only consider sperm whales stock or population independent if it's genetically different. In this case, both the green clan and the red clan are part of the same population because they're the same genetically, even though they have very different behaviors and they live in different places, they would be counted as the same thing. And that I show is very dangerous. Like we cannot assume that sperm whale in the Pacific behave the same as they do in the Atlantic because they don't. And we can't assume that the green clan behaves the same as the red clan because they don't. So I'm really much advocating to preserve culture and genetic diversity. It's like to have like cultural diversity be incorporated into animal conservation. Because we know how important cultural diversity is for humans. Like that is knowledge that we need to keep. And it's the same thing for the whales. We need to keep that cultural knowledge because obviously the knowledge from the green clan and the knowledge from the red clan is very different. They have different ways of living. They have different needs. They have different behaviors and they might react differently to threats. And that's something that they saw in the Pacific was that certain vocal clans do very well during El Nino years, which are like weather events, and some do very poorly. Because once again, some clans have that knowledge, they know how to deal with it, or maybe their strategy or their way of foraging is like benefited from having that thing and other clans don't. So they just have different ways of life. And uh, on top of this, as Zeros pointed out, vocal clans might face different threats. So this is most definitely the case in the Caribbean where the green clan and the red clans live around different islands. That means that local actions by members of those islands can really protect the whales. So if we go back to the map real quick, 
the green flan around Mar Dominica and the red ones around Martinique. If you have like a fantastic marine protected area around Martinique, you're only protecting the red whales. The green whales are not protected at all. So it's better to have two protected areas, like two smaller ones, one around Dominica and one around Martinique, so that you not only preserve the red clan, but you also preserve the green clan. So that way, not only are you preserving genetic diversity, because you're preserving whales, but you're also preserving cultural diversity, so they're like knowledge of the environment. And it's something that is still not implemented into conservation, but I am actively working uh, with the French government in the Caribbean to uh, try to incorporate independent conservation for both EC1, so the green whales and the red clan in the Caribbean. So I'm actually working with the government right now, giving them access to my research uh, so that they can protect vocal clans independently between Guadeloupe and Martinique, which are French territories, which is amazing. So yeah, there's also like another part of my PhD. I'm not gonna get into it today because it's like very like intense. And if you guys like today, I can do another entire presentation about it. With the take home messages of my PhD. So first, sperm whales are super cool. They're sick. They have big brains, big dramas, big bodies. They have the thickness and the smarts. We love that. <laughs> behaviors are socially driven not so much genetic so if you're a sperm whale a lot of what you do or where you live or how you go through life is something that you learn from your mom is something that you learn from your grandmother it's something that you learn from your aunt it's not so much it's not an instinct like sperm whales don't get born and they're like this is how i eat food like they learn it from others kind of like how a human baby learns from their mother learns from their parents and their peers how to live just like us like they're very much more like us than we often acknowledge. Because of this, because they learn everything socially, vocal clans and cultural group can be very different from each other. And that's something that we see in the Caribbean with the green clan and the red clan sounding very different, living in different areas and just like moving through the world in different ways. So, non-humans, non-human animals have much more complex lives than we think. We need to acknowledge it and incorporate this into conservation. We need to stop thinking that humans are like the pinnacle of existence, that we're like so cool and smart. Because, I mean, we are. But we're not alone. Like a lot of other animals are also very complex, have those very complex social interactions. And that's like beyond the sperm whale as well. Like monkeys, primates, ungulates, like insects, even like social insects, um, birds. Like there's so much and there's so little that we know. Like we need to keep going. So, yeah. Thank you guys. Uh, this is uh, just to acknowledge the funders of my PhD research. So as I said, it's funded by National Geographic Society, NSERC, which is the Canadian government, Animal Behavior Society, and AGWA, which is the French government in the Lesser Antilles, as well as all the people that helped me along the way. So my supervisor, my collaborators, and the volunteers that either helped on the boat or doing data analysis. So thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. Like, thanks to all the raiders, all the people chatting, asking questions, all the lurkers. Like, I'm, like, having so much fun, right? Like, this is, like, obviously something I'm very passionate about. And it may it means a lot for me that you guys are, like, listening in, acting, asking questions, like, being interested, and just being, like, your wonderful selves. Like, even if you're just, like, lurking or have this on the back or whatever, like, I really really appreciate everyone here today and you have like no idea like this means the world to me i'm like so happy right now this is like my two favorite things together like streaming with you guys and like talking about whales so it's like i'm, I'm like so happy <laughs> i won't accept it this time but if you come by next week again saying your dog ate your homework i'm gonna be disappointed <laughs>